Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. Yeah, we thought it was going to be... Uh... This uh, presentation has been approved for continuing education for certification maintenance. Um, in order for this session to meet those qualifications, it must last 60 minutes, so please come up with lots of hard questions for the members to no, answer. No. <laughs> uh, at the end of the session, uh, we can scan your badge. Either Jeff or I will scan your badge um, to mark this credit. Um, and uh, if you're an FCA member, that information on the talks that you attended will get e emailed to you. If you're not an FCA member, um, you can sign up at the booth to take part in this benefit. At this time, I'd like to introduce the moderator of this talk. It is uh, Captain Buss. Thank you. All right, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Defensive Cyber Operations Panel. Uh, my name is Captain Jeff Buss, uh, and, and as I look across the crowd, I see a number of people that taught me how to do defensive cyber operations. Uh, Mr. Kluster, Mr. Timmerman, uh, <laughs> Joel Lindemann, I see Ron Farm out there. So there's a whole bunch of folks uh, uh, here that I'm very excited to, to have in the audience and, and hopefully get some good questions afterwards. So thank you, everybody, for attending. So Scott Rodakowski asked me to put together a panel on defensive cyber operations strategy. So as I thought about how to do that, we, 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 when we generally build strategy, we look at the external environment, the internal environment, how things are working together and uh, maybe not working together. So I looked at uh, getting some of the all-stars from across the uh, DOD, uh, and so I'm very honored and humbled to have with us today a group of uh, my mentors, my peers, and some of my heroes uh, sitting here before you, uh, guys that are actually uh, doing the job. Uh, not just talking about it. So these are the folks that uh, when there's a hack or some, something big happens in DOD, these are the guys that are up till 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, getting back up at 4 o'clock in the morning, coming back into work. So uh, the guys, as uh, the former DCC commander, uh, we have the DCC commander currently back there, these are the guys that he relies on on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to work up and down the kill chain, if you will, to stop whatever's happening in the defensive cyber operations world uh, uh, from happening. So... Uh, without further ado, I want uh, each of the panel mem members, if you would, just introduce yourself really quickly, and then uh, we'll start uh, straight away with some questions. So, Paul Kraft, over to you. Is it on? Can you hear me? So, yeah, okay, thank you. So, just real quick, uh, my name is uh, uh, Colonel Paul Kraft. I'm uh, the commander for DISA Global Operations Command. It's uh, an organization that's out at Scott Air Force Base. Uh, about 1,000 folks in the headquarters, about 1,500 folks total spread across the United States. The responsibility of uh, District Global Operations Command, uh, we're the ones that actually run the Internet doors for the DOD. There's 10 Internet doors. We're also the ones that have to defend the boundary doors for the DOD. Uh, we're the ones that actually also run uh, DNS. Uh, so we're root for the, all of the DOD. Uh, we run email security. For anyone that's using enterprise email security, um, we, we, uh, we're the ones that will defend all the data centers within DISA's uh, enterprise, uh, the coalition networks, defending the cloud access points, uh, the Nipper Federated Gateway for our coalition partners. Um, we're the ones that run the system known as JRSS, Joint Regional Security Stacks, um, run and defend them and maintain them. And then we're the, also the CSSP for over 130 customers DOD-wide, COCOMs, five combatant commanders, um, services, and 15 different agencies across the DOD from a CSSP Tier 2 provider perspective. So just a framework for uh, kind of what, what uh, my current job is as the, the commander and what we do primarily out of Scott, also Columbus, Ohio, Pensacola, Florida, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, um, St. Louis, Missouri, Springfield, Virginia, and also up at, at Fort Meade. So we're in multiple locations, running the DOD's network, and our headquarters, again, is at Scott Air Force Base. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sean Heritage. I am the CO, or Commanding Officer of Navy Cyber Defense Operations Command in Suffolk, Virginia, and the Commander of Task Force 1020, which is the Navy's Defensive Cyberspace Operations Task Force. Uh, we do some of what Paul's team does um, for, for the Navy. We do not operate the networks. We defend the networks. Uh, we are co-located with the Navy's Network Warfare Command in Suffolk, Virginia. We share a building, uh, and they operate the networks that we defend, or we defend the, operate, we defend the networks that they operate. Uh, within our task force, we have um, 1020.1, which focuses on our CSSP, cybersecurity uh, service provider responsibilities. 
We have 1020.2, which is our afloat DCO mission. We have DCO, Defensive Cyberspace Operations Deployers, in every strike group and, and ARG. Uh, 1020.3 is the Navy's red team, which has recently been aligned to us. And we also have one CPT, the 552 Cyber Protection Team, that is, is, is aligned to us. So within the Navy, there's lots of people doing DCO to varying degrees. We are kind of where it all comes together uh, on behalf of Fleet Cybercom. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Colonel Brian Lytle, and uh, to depart a little bit from my esteemed peers up on the stage, I'm actually the Program Executive Officer for Cyber Development at the Defense Information Systems Agency. So I am, I am not a signal operator. I'm a dirty, nasty acquisition weasel. Um, my business is the design and development of all of the illustrious defensive cyber tools that we operate uh, within DISA and also have enterprise licenses uh, that we provide down to uh, Navy, Air Force, Army, as well as the other 70-odd components within the, the Defense Department. Um, you probably know us best uh, by our work at the Internet Access Points that are owned and operated by Colonel Kraft. Uh, all the Defense Department information that comes in and through the email gateways, and you see that nice little banner that's saying, you know, this is from a non-DOD source and we neuter the links. That's my fault, but I do it because Captain Bus told me to. So don't forget that. I work for the operators, and I, I go out and get them things and fetch. Um, I own JRSS, the Joint Regional Security Stacks, uh, as well as HBSS, all the other endpoint protections. Uh, more on that a little bit later. Uh, all the Cyber C2 SA systems, such as Big Data Platform, CSAC, SecDef Cyber Scorecard that everyone knows and loves, uh, as well as identity management, such as PKI and Assured Identity that Lieutenant General Lynn addressed yesterday uh, in his remarks. So I'm um, the design and, the, and build function. We're a, a fairly significant size company, about the size of any the largest pro sports teams across the world. A um, lot of work. A lot of fun. Get to work with these guys all the time. Uh, if you have questions, especially on the vendor side for things that are coming up, would love to talk to you about it. If you are on the operations side, which I see we have a, a good, healthy number in the audience tonight, would love to know your opinions on some of the tools that we have out in the, uh, the architecture today. Thanks. So my name, is, my name is Colonel Cleo Thomas. I'm the Director of Operations for JFHQ Joden. I have the easy job of synchronizing all of this group uh, together and making sure that we meet all the requirements for the Department of Defense. So we're a direct report to Cybercom. Over 40 agencies represent the Department of Defense Information Network, and our job is to make sure that from an operational standpoint that they're good to go uh, and they're squared away. So in a nutshell, that's all I do. I just synchronize 40 people. That's extremely hard, uh, but that's it for me. All right, so these guys are the, the Sidney Crosbys of DCO. You're talking former WACA commander, uh, Sean is about to head to DIUX, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, first, uh, one of our first naval folks, uh, especially at the rank of captain, going out there. So excited for that. Uh, so for, for the vendors, I don't know if you've worked with DIUX, but it's a pretty interesting uh, venue, and I'm sure Sean can tell you more about that. Uh, and uh, Colonel Kraft is coming up to JFHQ Doden to be the J3, so we're pretty excited about that uh, uh, here, here shortly. <laughs> Uh, so with, with any good strategy, I wanted to, uh, to start with kind of an external scan of what we're seeing uh, from a DoD standpoint happening at the boundary as well as the Tier 2 level. So I think it's helpful as we do that to define the different tiers. So uh, Tier 0, Tier 1, and Tier 2, are, are, I just want to make sure folks understand that and why I put the panel together the way I did. So the Tier 0 is generally considered to be your ISP. Uh, so your Tier 1 is going to be your boundary protection, and your Tier 2 uh, is going to be your individual networks like uh, NMCI or NGEN or, or Sean's folks. So you'll see in the crowd we've got the Tier 2 folks, we've got the Tier 1 folks, uh, we, we've got Cleo Thomas that runs the entire shoot match up and down and across, uh, and then you've got the, the, the person that's responsible for building it, uh, which is Brian Lytle. So you're going to see a lot of varying opinions, which I thought would be interesting for the, for the crowd to understand that it's not all synchronized perfectly across all levels. And you've got all levels here today from a build uh, as well as operate and defend uh, perspective. So anyway, so if you've got any questions at the end, we'll, we'll do 45 minutes and then we'll uh, do 15 minutes of question and answer at the end. And we'll be available afterwards to answer any questions you might have. So, Paul, the first question I'll turn over to you. Uh, I would like to kind of characterize the external environment that you're seeing. You and Sean, if you would answer this one. Uh, the biggest challenges just as facing from your level, uh, from the external environment specifically, in regards to the defense of your networks. Thank you. So, um, 
I'll say running the boundary is a, is a daily fight. We've got um, about 200 folks that are on net, uh, 24 by 7, doing that uh, defensive mission uh, around the U.S. and around the world. Our biggest threat right now, it's uh, I'll say in the paper that, that you see, is, uh, is, is uh, spear phishing. Okay? Uh, attacks that we receive uh, through our uh, emails. This isn't just people that are... Uh, Nation states, people, uh, cyber criminals that are trying to get to our, our DOD employees and clear defense contractors uh, through their government accounts, but it's also folks that are trying to get to us through their uh, personal email accounts because people do check personal email on, uh, on their government machines. I know, that, I know that happens, and sometimes when they do open up those attachments, that is another means or another door to be able to get in uh, because of uh, going through Gmail or Hotmail or whatever the case is, Yahoo. Uh, as a means. So um, number two for us, and these are, uh, I'll say, uh, fairly well-known um, statistics. I'm not divulging anything that isn't well-known. Uh, two is credential harvesting. So I, I would say that's secondary. So the first step is uh, get in with an email. Second step is then to be able to harvest those credentials um, that are out there. Number three for us is... Um, is DOS, so denial of service, uh, directed denial of service. That's where someone's trying to come in and hit us with 500 meg, uh, 10 gig, 20 gig attacks. You probably all remember the, uh, the Mariah botnet. Uh, we were in the hundreds of gig range. Uh, our, our doors are about 10 gigs each, so you throw something at us that's bigger than that, which is rarity, something only a, really a nation state can do. That's a bad day for us, and we have methods and measures we'll talk about later in the how about how we stop a massive attack against the DOD. Um, those, and, and it has to be done in a, in a defense and depth perspective, um, I'll say going forward. So I'll say those are the big three things from a, a defensive perspective that we deal with regularly. We have layers of defense to be able to handle those things. It's a constantly changing environment that we're up against. Nation states are always changing their TTPs. Uh, it's not as simple as what it was, you know, 10 years ago where if you blocked the IP, it, it stopped the attack. Because all that happens in, this, in the world today is IPs change instantaneously. So it's a constant back and forth today in the external environment. It is a constant back and forth fight, knife fight, with our nation states every single day using any one of those top three. There's obviously more than three, but I'll give you kind of the, the big three things that we see on a regular basis. Okay. Turn it over to, uh, to Sean. I'll take a different approach to the answer. So I, I, I believe everything what Paul said to be true. We see much of the same things within the, the Navy networks. Um, but beyond that, I'd like to answer from a perspective of the user behavior as the external environment, the network understanding as an external environment, as well as the physical partnerships with teammates like you as part of the external environment. So. I know that many of us are uh, served but are wear not wearing a uniform today. So is there any Navy teammates out there? All right. So our Navy teammates, we, if you've read the uh, Fleet Cybercom strategy, you are very familiar with the term, we operate our network as a warfighting platform. It's great words. Um, if you are aware of how we actually behave, you would think that that is not the case. Um, we have not... Um, helped our cause uh, when it comes to developing capability in the form of local defenders. So our, our local expertise and ability to defend our networks at the distant end is not where it needs to be. Um, that is a challenge. Up until yesterday, I, um, I was of the mind that user behavior had improved dramatically uh, since I started paying attention to this. I took a brief yesterday that was focused on one of our strike groups getting ready for deployment, and our, our blue team talked us through the top five observations after scanning their networks. And user behavior continues to be atrocious. So where Paul talked about this from a threat perspective, more from a vulnerability perspective, we are accepting too much risk on our networks. Some knowingly, some unknowingly. But when you engage with Navy personnel, I'd ask for you to dig deeper behind those, the nice bumper sticker of operating our network as a warfighting platform. Um, Network understanding. So if you've been following the progression of the, the development of the cyber protection teams, our cyber protection teams, national as well as service, 
I think have been doing a great job to help us get a better understanding of our network and what it is uh, and what the current readiness posture is. So we are trending in the positive in that direction as we employ that capability. But the WannaCry experience made it abundantly clear that we do not understand our networks to the degree necessary. I'd watched uh, emails flow back and forth between the CNO, Admiral Rogers, um, as well as Admiral, um, um, brain fart, Fleet, Admiral Davidson at Fleet Forces Command. Uh, the length of time it's, it takes us to get an understanding of, of what is truly happening on our networks, how we are postured to, to patch and scan, it's, it's clearly not where it needs to be. So our, our external environment is of great, great concern. Uh, but lastly, I think on a, on a very positive note is forums like this. When we look at how big our team is, it is focused on our shared problem set. So I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today and for all the capabilities that you continue to develop to help our cause. So from an external environment, we need to do better when it comes to user behavior, developing capability on the distant end, host level. Uh, internally, we need to get a better understanding of our networks. Um, and we need to leverage these partnerships that you guys have been so gracious to help build and strengthen. So thank you for that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, let me add one, one more thing. So we all know about Patch Tuesday. We all know that the patches come out, and we know that it's our responsibility within the DoD is get it patched quickly. Um, I, I will tell you as a, you know, the, the command that runs the boundary, we are immediately scanned for any of those vulnerabilities. We are immediately scanned those vulnerabilities by our adversaries. So the speed at which we are able to fix known knowns must collapse greatly from an environment perspective. We think we have time. You know, Patch Tuesday happens, and then we've got to check with the PMs and get those systems approved and then get the patches actually actually thrown on there. But I'll tell you, that, that gap between when it comes out and when the enemy is checking on it because they're looking at the same patches that come out that we are is clearly if that's a patch that's going to come out then that's a known vulnerability and that's what I'm going to go after like the next hour. Okay, so uh, from an external environment perspective we have to be ready to respond much quicker because the adversary is responding just as quickly to Patch Tuesday from the enemy's perspective as we are to, uh, to Patch Tuesday, or, or that we try to from, from a Patch Tuesday perspective. So I'm sorry, I just gave you a, a fourth one. Thank you. So I'll add one thing on that. Um, one thing we have to do is prioritize, though. I mean, Patch Tuesday comes out, you know, it's based on something. You know, we, we collect intel from Cybercom. We're a direct report to Cybercom. There's a lot of three-letter organizations that have intel that's relating to certain events. Uh, one of the complaints that, you know, I field all the time from the 40-plus agencies is, what's really important, Cleo? You know, you just pushed 30 orders to me, and now you're telling me i got to get them all done within, you know, from five days to seven days all the way up to 21 days. So we have to do a better job of giving them that process intel to say, this is a priority, this is what I need you to go after. But I 100% agree with Paul. From my venue, immediate scans of all vulnerabilities. As the vulnerabilities come out, the adversary clearly understands that, and we have to do our part um, by patching our systems early and we have to do our part at JFHQ Doden by prioritizing those patches and letting you know what's really important. And we do have an initiative underway to make sure we do that. So, and Brian, you can back me on this one. But so, so one of the interesting things I found is, is being in the acquisition side down with uh, Colonel Lytle now is the DOD used to be all of the Internet, uh, right? So, so we are not all of the Internet anymore. Uh, and when we go to negotiate with vendors, it's, it's interesting. We are just another customer, not necessarily the only customer. And I'm going to... Naval Aviator by, by background, right? So when I go to Lockheed Martin and I want to buy an F-35, we are the only game in town. We are not the only game in town anymore when it comes to, you know, buying whatever router, whatever switch, uh, which creates a very interesting environment for us, and it's changing uh, dramatically because we are a COTS-based organization, uh, and we've developed our systems with that in mind, uh, which there's, there's benefits and there's drawbacks to doing that. Uh, Brent, I don't know if you want to talk at all about that, but that's certainly something I've felt in the ac acquisition side. Yeah, so good, good question. I think the, uh, the larger question you're asking is how do you actually acquire or procure products to enable operators out in the field? Um, you, you brought up a good point. Most of the things that we do are COTS, pieces of gear, comment, or commercial off the shelf. Um, very deliberately so. I'm, I'm taking advantage of all of the work that's been done by uh, industry as well as the other partners and, and companies across the world 
to, I'll, I'll say, speed up the acquisition. I don't have to go through a testing cycle. I don't have to go through a research and development cycle. I don't have to get funds from Congress in order to do that two to three years ahead of time. Very simply, I'm trying to buy the best piece of gear I can off the shelf, integrate that into the rest of the, the fairly large architecture that we have, um, and ensure that it works across the board for all the component commands. Um, not just DISA, uh, as Colonel Kraft brought up, he is the, the perimeter, owns the perimeter hog leave. However, it's also got to go down uh, into all of the services and the rest of the components within DOD. Um, the, the DOD 5000 teachings that we have culturally within the acquisition community uh, is a bit problematic with that kind of a strategy. Uh, so what I try to deliberately encourage my folks and the operators who give me the requirements is I, I, I want you to focus on an end state. I want you to focus on here's the operational capability and what it has to do in order to pass muster to get a go at this station and to move forward and put the piece of gear into operation. It is less on the dotting the I's and crossing the T's on the paperwork from an acquisition standpoint, which I think everybody in the community really does not like, me included. Um, I really want to focus on in-state capabilities and how quickly can I put those into operation. So our, our cycle time, I think, within the PEO is not measured in years now. It's now measured more in months. But it's also a very deliberate cultural break uh, that we try to partner very directly with the commands that we support. So unity of effort is probably the, the key point to take away from that. I have enough waivers within legislation. Um, I try to exploit them as much as possible. Uh, however, sometimes the bureaucracy gets in my way. Okay, thank you. So next uh, step in building strategy is to look at the internal workings and how are things going. So I wanted to turn this one over to Colonel Thomas to start. Uh, so if you could characterize the internal environment that you're seeing currently, uh, Cleo, and uh, discuss kind of the way ahead and some challenges you face there. Yeah, so I had a couple of notes before the panel started talking, and I changed the number one to know yourself. Uh, a lot of organizations out there really don't know their networks. So when we call them and we talk to them and we ask them, what is the overall threat? Can you give it to me? Uh, so we can bring that threat together and paint a picture for Admiral Rogers or even my boss, Lieutenant General Lynn, to make sure that he understands the threat for whatever's out there. A lot of units clearly, they don't know their networks. And when it comes to clear defense contractors, their connections, VPN connections, what's actually going on inside the network that they own, uh, it's hard for them to explain that to us. So that's number one for me now. Uh, number two is um, unidentified global threats from a variety of different sources. Um, Paul hit on it. Uh, Paul is definitely my best friend when it comes to protecting the boundary. Uh, we call on Tier 0 and Tier 1 quite often to, to establish that first line of defense. Uh, WannaCrypt is a perfect example. WannaCrypt, WannaCry, perfect example. On a Friday night at 1700, I look at CNN and all of a sudden the old crap moment comes in. Uh, the first person I call is Paul Kraft and find out what's going on. And then from that analysis, then we start um, churning and doing things inside of JFHQ Doden to make sure that we can meet the requirements and synchronize all of the forces together. Because my primary job is to defend the Department of Defense Information Network. That's what Cybercom has told us to do and also command and control the network. So the next one is mature intel that supports defensive cyber operations. So Intel is great. My J2 is right there in front of me, so I'm not going to say anything bad while he's here. But when he leaves, I'll give you the real story. Um, but bottom line is we have to have Intel associated with the network that our particular mission. And Intel does a great job of pushing that information to us. Um, but we've created an Intel infusion cell with inside of JFHQ Doden to process that information. So Intel is doing what they need to do. I put them right next to a technical person and then form that level of translation right there on the spot. The next one is the integration of ops, Intel, and technology. So this panel is awesome because it's all of those phases. JFHQ Doden is an operational unit. I'm not trying to buy the next widget. You know, I'm not trying to go out and do those type of things. I am focused on operationalizing the Doden in order to meet mission requirements. You know, we want to, you know, when you need the Doden, we want it to be there. So in order to do that, we depend on everybody at, on this panel to meet their own, their personal mission requirements in order so we can meet ours. And the last one is synchronizing, um, synchronization of technologies. So when DISA comes up with an upgrade for a certain technology, I have to make sure that it meets those requirements that we've laid out in terms of defending the Doden. 
We look at the current threats. We work closely with DISA on acquisition, and we create a campaign plan that meets the desire, the requirements of both of the organizations. So General Lynn wears two hats. He's the director of DISA, but he's also the JFHQ DOD commander. So those decisions, he sees both sides, and we have to sit down as a group with him and lay out our strategic plan for at least 12 months to figure out what are we going to do next. And it has to meet the operational requirements as well as the technical requirements. So from that standpoint, oh, the last one is endpoint protection. So um, spear fishing is a perfect example. So we have to figure out from internal, how do we do a better job for endpoint protection? That's it. So from an internal perspective, uh, for JFHQ, there, it's been a a large change and shift in mentality. So, so you'll see uh, Sean Heritage ships. So, so I can't order Sean to wear uh, SDV, service dress blues, but Cleo can. So as the DCC commander, I, I can't order the Navy to do things, uh, uh, but JFHQ Doden can, and that makes a big difference uh, and changes the dynamic of how uh, we operate the, the Doden, if you will. Sean, any comments or Paul, any comments? I'll, um, I'll chime in on the evolution of JFHQ Doden. So I remember my last job, I was Admiral Rogers' exec. I remember the day that he directed the, the formation of JFHQ Doden. Did so with a specific purpose, and that was to change the culture over at DISA, to remind them that they are not just an acquisition or a technology cor a corporation. <laughs> um, they're a military organization. Um, and Cleo did a great job of highlighting their focus. Right, so now I've switched jobs. Now I work for JFHQ Doden in many capacities, and they have made a huge difference in synchronizing things across our services. Um, as Jeff pointed out, I am wearing a different uniform. I'm wearing a different uniform on purpose. Um, I told him yesterday that I was not going to wear SDVs uh, in an effort to communicate to all of you that, at least within the Navy, we do things differently internally. Sometimes that's good reason. Sometimes it's not. So as I work in the DCO mission, I will recognize that there's goodness and different means of accomplishing similar ends. Uh, no one uniform is better than the next, but at some time we have to become uniform. So I'll talk a little bit later about the efforts that Navy is making uh, to standardize things across the board. But much like our uniforms right now, our DCO teams are not unified in effort and oftentimes not unified in action. Yeah, but if, if Captain Buss would have told me that Sean was wearing a different uniform, I'd have used my DACO authority and ordered him to be in the right uniform. Thank you, Cleo. <laughs> so I'll just hit uh, on some challenges. I think the next question will actually be what we're doing about it. So uh, challenges for us is um, in our environment, multiple enclaves. Every agency has their own enclave. There's multiple enclave um, capabilities even within, uh, within DISA. And then we have multiple classifications of those networks. And then within that, we have multiple vendor solutions within that. Believe it or not, we have it's not one single vendor that we go to. We like to use all different vendors. So we have challenges in being able to integrate multiple different types of vendors, many doing the same things, but with a different type of technology. So that, that is a challenge internally within the DOD. Enclave level, down to Tier 2, down to the services, down to the agencies. No one's running the same singular technology, uh, but we've got to make all those technologies work. So that's, uh, that is a challenge, number one. Challenge number two I mentioned earlier from an external perspective, so now I'll bring it inside the house, is the speed at which we're able to fix no knowns, and also the speed at which we're able to fix, patch, defend uh, the unknowns. Okay, so we may be doing some analysis, some real-time analysis, and figure out that this is now a bad thing, and how fast can we turn and get that problem fixed that was, we'll call it zero day or zero hour or zero minute um, that we see our sensors start to, to buzz on. So the ability to uh, handle that at speed is a challenge. And the last one that I, I would say is event characterization, which gets to speed. Again, multiple vendors that are out there, all great vendors, all great products. Um, but we've got to be able to do event correlation as it goes through flow data, full PCAP data, sensor data, firewall data, whatever the case is from the NetOps side or from the DCO side that we're talking about now, to be able to create those instance and events, be able to manage those, and to be able to tip and queue what our response actions are. So we're, we're clearly looking for our challenges. We don't have a clear picture of looking at the entirety of the sensor grid 
using the big data platform known as Acropolis, where our sensor feeds go, to be able to be able to pull out and have actionable intelligence uh, from an intel for cyber intelligence perspective to be able to say, based on all these indications and warnings, we need to do this and need to be able to do it at speed and do it at this layer. Yep. Okay, so I'll kind of end with the challenges because I think we'll get into uh, what we're doing about it. Yeah, thank you. So the next piece of trying to develop strategy, what, what major changes are happening? I, I think we hit a lot of them, but Sean, I want to turn it back over to you to answer any other major changes that you see happening in your portion of DoD Cyber. Well, I would acknowledge the, the level of interest from our most senior leaders. I, I alluded to it earlier in the, 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 the personal interest that the CNO, that the Commander of Fleet Forces Command and Commander of U.S. Cyber Command is having in our def defensive spot posture. A lot of times... Uh, we see talk, we see investments on the offensive side, uh, but increasingly defense is becoming the priority that the Secretary of Defense stated in the cyber strategy. So there's goodness there. I mentioned the JFHQ Doden evolution. Um, the aggregation of capability within the Navy has also been something that I personally am um, uh, grateful for. So when I was talking about Navy in, in, in CDOC, and who makes up our team, the fact that we now have a Navy Red team that's focused, truly, true focus is defensive cyberspace operations. So yesterday, uh, I mentioned I took a brief, the, the Navy Red team had a, a slide that was, you know, red, yellow, green. In their mind, red is, you know, just like we're, we're accustomed to, red is not good, green is good. Uh, but they were characterizing the good, the green, was them getting into our networks and, and making us do foolish things. That's not the focus of a red team. The focus of a red team is to raise our game on the defensive side. So trying to help them understand that they are the premier or a premier DCO team that's making us better. So when the DCO team succeeds, they succeed. When the DCO team fails, that's not their success. Um, and then forums like this, again, the, the partnerships with, with industry is a significant... Um, you know, there's been significant progress in that, that standpoint. So we have two initiatives um, down there at NCDOC. I won't get too specific on them, but one, we, we have an initiative called TRON, Transferring Risk Off Nippernet. So we acknowledge that we are not operating our network as a warfighting platform. You know, that if you look at the, the way we're using our bandwidth on our warfighting platform, you would acknowledge that. YouTube does not belong on a warfighting platform. G webmail does not belong on a warfighting platform. There are solutions out there, probably many of you have developed them, uh, that allow us to have the connectivity that our sailors, soldiers, Marines, and airmen deserve, quality of life standpoint, but they do not belong on our warfighting platform. So we're, again, we're making more progress in that regard. And the second um, experiment, if you will, is leveraging tools that you guys are building uh, to get a better understanding of what's happening on the endpoint. Again, the speed of response is important, but it can't be just about response. Right? It has to be prevention as well. So to me, there's lots of goodness that are happening from a technology side and from an awareness side. Uh, but the area that I think that we were lacking most, at least within the Navy, our Army teammates have done a wonderful job uh, catching us and surpassing us on the, um, the personnel side, the development of true expertise in this mission area and a commitment to actually affording a career path that allows mastery to be a possibility. Um, we were down a path that was leading us toward, toward that as a Navy. Um, we need to get back on track. Captain okay. Bus, if I could chime in on that sure. as well. So I, I, I'm going to chime in with my operational peers to say that I, I, I've heard it and watched it. Our own internal architecture analysis has said essentially the same thing, perhaps a different uh, set of lenses that we look through. Um, to Colonel Thomas's point, the, the point where we are going to change the most in the future is probably at the end point. I, I think the perimeter is okay. It's never stable. It's never great. But that's simply one of the layers in defense that we have. Uh, what we're looking for for endpoint protection now is HBSS, as you know it, will most likely change uh, to going from a signature-based product looking at what is, what is occurring and preventing something from happening 
post-term on an individual endpoint to three or more specific capabilities that we're looking for now. A, a containment capability, such as what Captain Heritage talked about specifically. I'm looking for a browsing solution to limit the path and the ability to actually write to a disk and have a vulnerability be written onto a disk and percolated across the network and go laterally. So I'm looking for a, a containment solution there. Visibility solution to understand exactly what is occurring on an individual endpoint. Is it patched as Colonel Kraft talked about? Has it been updated quickly and how, how what's the speed of our remediation to actually patch that known known and see what else is occurring? How many Windows XP boxes do I have within the architecture uh, that are still in operation today? And the last one would be endpoint uh, detect and respond, automatically notify at the perimeter level or to a, a CSSP what is occurring in, on my individual machine down within an enclave, whether it's a unit or a computing center, et cetera, back up to the CSSP to understand what is going on on that specific machine in and of itself. So those are the major changes that I, I see occurring. Some of that becomes a unity of effort between DISA as the, the combat support agency acquiring the solutions, but also from the, de uh, the Defense Department CIO to the component commands to all agree upon a solution and move forward with it. Um, we do get into tool and vendor wars to some extent, uh, so that's where I say we need the unity of effort behind that in order to make it actually happen. So I'll... I'll say one thing on that one. We got to have the ability to roll this information up. You know, we all have our different solutions for, you know, all of our internal problems. But from a Doden standpoint, my boss wants to know the risk to the Doden. You know, everybody down below us is taking risk at their own level. But JFHQ Doden, we established the risk for the entire DOD. And we have to have the ability to quickly grab that data from no matter where it is, from endpoints, CSSPs, or whatever, and roll it up into one common platform to where we can quickly turn that information and report back to Cybercom the overall risk to the DOD networks. And that's extremely important. And we're fighting that battle every day when it comes to compliance. And that compliance is in from a variety of different things. It's from orders that we publish that's linked directly to a vulnerability that we know is a known vulnerability that could cause huge impact to the Department of Defense. We're on the phone calling organizations and saying, hey, have you, you know, put this patch in place? Are you finished with this order? And in today's environment, we shouldn't have to call an organization to get a report about something technical in nature. That information should flow directly up to us. And that's something we definitely need help with. So... Three, three responses I owed, I owed them to you. So I talked about the issues of uh, multiple enclaves, multiple vendors, what are we going to do about that? Um, a solution that DISA now has, and we're putting um, software developers, hardware developers, we'll call it DevOpers, uh, is coming up with a DevOps capability, put that within the operations center. Uh, great vendors that are out there, but increasing vendor responsiveness to help the vendor make their tool work to the best of that tool's ability that's great. What's even better than great is to make sure that tool is integrated with other tools using open standards to make sure that those tools work. So we're really looking, we, the agency, are really looking for increased DevOps of the tools that you've already handed us with increased responsiveness and better integration using open standards to ensure that those tools work to the optimum ability that's possible. That's, that's number one. The second one to handle speed is uh, DISA now, DISA in partnership with, uh, with, with NSA, are working on and have now auto-blocking systems uh, within our boundary and within our email. Okay, so before it was basically running in a, in a, uh, a, a singular, we'll call it a, a massive firewall system. Uh, once it's a known known, you burp in that countermeasure, you manually put in that countermeasure in hours, minutes, hours, and then it does the block. Uh, at the boundary. Now we have a new system that's online to where it now auto blocks. So we're now auto blocking using uh, auto learning and some heuristic models to where we're now making blocks on the boundary about every uh, minute and a half. Every 1.6 minutes, we're now doing auto blocking at the boundary. Massive, massive change of capability within DOD in very recent times. The second thing that was just, again, turned on in the last 
two weeks was auto blocking now of email. I talked about the biggest threat vector that the DoD had, which was um, spear phishing and whaling. Well, we now have turned on a capability. Uh, it's not it's not full rate production right now, but um, to do auto blocking, same thing. Um, doing uh, doing a lot of learning uh, on net learning and doing a lot of history, heuristic modeling, but being able to put in auto blocks into our, our network that we have today. So those are just two things that we put in place to solve some of our speed problems of a more of a machine-to-machine -machine talk because we'll never have enough analysts. We're not going to be able to necessarily people our way out of the problem without using great technology. We're really going to tech our way out of this from a defensive posture. Okay, so we certainly need the, a vendor support in, in order to in order to do that, um, and the great people on the side to make those tools work. Uh, and the last thing is working collaboratively, having a collaborative system in place so that we can speed the decision making of what we're going to do next, really from JFHQ and down JFHQ Doden down to those forty different agencies, including DISA, down to the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and down to those agencies. Um, on what has to happen at, at, at net speed in order to d better defend the DOD. So those are the big three things that we've done now to solve some of the challenges that we have. Yeah, so that's good lead into the next question. Uh, Colonel Thomas, I, I turn this one over to you to talk briefly about your organization's strategy for how you fight and defend the DODEN. Right, so I'll, I'll start with a, a comment. And, and my comment is, want to cry in the event of a crisis turn into a great defensive victory for us. So historically, when we go in Admiral Rogers' office or other people's office, the number one focus sometimes turns to the offensive side. But for WannaCry, I mean, we were the stars of the show. Um, my battle captains, a couple of them sitting in the office, took processed intel, well, we took intel, and we, we took that intel and turned it into orders to synchronize the defensive forces across the dome. And every day we updated, we changed, we maneuvered, we took that information and we distributed it to 40 plus organizations to make sure that they clearly understood what was a priority across the board. And based on that and the prep that we put into it, we didn't have any um, incidents on the dome. So that was a victory. So that's some of the changes that are happening. And I'll go back to my original comment. We are truly operationalizing the dome. There is no longer a tech sitting on a, on a desk forcing us to make decisions. We're looking at it from an operational standpoint. And so in order to do that, we're publishing an order, and the name of the order is Operation Gladiator Shield. Probably means nothing, but it means something to the field. But it enables JFHQ Doden to synchronize globally Doden operations and to make sure that people are held accountable for their particular areas. Part of that order is breaking it up into areas of operation. And so every commander, every director, every agency is responsible for their particular area. And that's how they're going to report back up to JFHQ Doden. Our entire structure at JFHQ Doden is focused around these areas of operation, from agencies to combatant commands to service cyber components uh, to even working directly with Cybercom. We've taken an outward focus approach to deal with these organizations. And that information flows in, and internal to JFHQ Doden, we are now structured to support that same type of battle stations. So that is our number one focus for now. We're going to reinforce accountability throughout the Doden, because every commander should be accountable for their particular area of operations. And this order is going to give them formats. It'll give them templates, and it'll establish reporting requirements back from that organization to JFHQ Doden, just to make sure that we're synchronized. And the last thing we're doing is we're task organizing cyber defensive forces. We own six uh, Doden CPTs, and those six Doden CPTs are aligned to key areas throughout the Department of Defense Information Network. But they also form a habitual relationship with agencies, service cyber components, and they learn from other CPTs that are on the ground. So not only are they Doden owned and operated, they also are establishing a clear line of communications to people who do not have resources. And so agencies, they don't have a CPT that they can call on in order to meet their mission requirements. We're now pushing those forces down to them so they're part of the team. And a lot of these organizations, they don't even have JWIGs or SIPR or other things. So we need, they need that level of translation and the CPTs are gonna provide that information for them. And so in the event of a crisis like WannaCry, defensive cyber operations 
you know, they had a crown on their head and we went in and we won that initial fight. Uh, so that's definitely a victory and that's changing the mindset. And that goes right in line with what Sean was talking about earlier. Commanders now understand that the defensive posture is extremely important. And you have to patch systems prior to in order to meet those mission requirements. So I, I, I'd like to chime in as well. I think my, my background, in case you don't know the Army uniforms, I'm a field artillery officer and came up through the, the G3, J3 uh, physical domains rather than signal. I, I think one of the areas for improvement within the cyber domain is, is we can adopt the same kind of enterprise architecture and an operationalization uh, in-state focused approach that our physical killer peers have uh, within their domains. It is the end state that you are looking for. It's an understanding of your environment. Can a commander visualize, understand, describe, and direct his or her forces to take action and, and come through on some kind of strategic end state? Um, within my PEO, we are focusing on an enterprise architecture, uh, understanding what is that architecture, which tools actually fit within that architecture, and what are the data feeds and speeds that allow commanders and staff to take action or make some kind of decision and move forward uh, into the cyberspace fight. Um, so that means that some of the tools are going to be pushed out. Uh, from within our architecture. You heard the panel with my boss, Mr. Hickey, yesterday. How do you innovate uh, with industry in the cyber domain? And that is, I think, to a person what all the panel members said. You have to understand what's your enterprise architecture and push out the things that are not necessary and focus on the ones that provide some kind of value. Um, I've got over 40, perhaps 50 tools within the architecture. All of them are valuable to some extent, but um, where am I going to get the greatest bang for the buck? Uh, so in terms of defending the network and how do we provide, uh, working with the DOD CIO, who are our masters in terms of funding and acquisition policy, as well as the legislative branch of the government, Congress, uh, both sides of Congress have said they are not going to reduce down cyber funding. However, they ain't going to give me any more than what I got. All right, And that, that's a pretty good promise um, from everything that is moving through the political realms right now. Uh, so I have the funding, but then it's where do I spend the money, and I'm dependent upon unity of effort from the commands to, uh, I'll say, direct where we want to go. Okay, so thank you. We're at 11.31, so I want to open the floor to questions. So I would say, unless your last name ends with uh, Farb, Castillo, or Pierce, I invite you to come and ask questions. What about, what about Andy McClellan? I'm just kidding, Ron. You can ask questions if you want. Hi, good morning. What a fantastic panel. Michael Lucero, Vencore. So this is the CIO, CISO, what do we do with that next dollar that we have to spend question? We've been implementing automation, artificial intelligence, the machine learning. What are we learning from that automation? What are we, it's still nascent in many of the networks, but clearly we're getting indicators back that inform how we look at architectures, how we redesign those architectures, what are we doing to collapse the networks in a different way based on what we're learning from that level of automation and uh, artificial intelligence. So Colonel Idle, I think that's a good one yeah. for you. Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I'm gonna vector over to Colonel Kraft here in a minute to back me up because he's the implementer of all the tools that I go out and build. Um, so industry does have a set of machine learning. Uh, some of the bigger worldwide companies, such as a Google and a Facebook, do have artificial intelligence that go through and comb and actually track your trends. They serve up the ads that they think uh, will be useful to you. They track where you are on Google Maps, provide helpful information to your web page, et cetera, uh, on what they think you might buy or purchase. So from an artificial intelligence perspective, Moving forward and actually defending a network, that way we don't have that kind of spend money or compute power vector towards that uh, angle yet. Um, that is the wave of the future. That is part of the, the next offset or the third generation offset um, that's talked about by the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, we are implementing machine learning right now. Uh, what is the feedback I talked about earlier? From an individual endpoint, can I get back that information back up to a cyber defense service provider or automate a block from the perimeter to stop the, that malware or viruses from coming into the network right now? So that, that is how we're going to evolve out is to link all of those layers of defense together to have a faster solution and better informed decisions by the commanders and staff. And I think, Colonel Kraft, you're actually implementing it now. Do you have any feedback you want to provide? 
so so nascent's the right word. Um, I, I would say that the 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 tact that we are taking uh, within the DoD right now, I'll, I'll take a step back and say we're different different machine machine mean lear, learning is going on, not so much in the uh, AI uh, side as far as the DoD, but what we're really looking at to help us be better, faster, stronger, sometimes cheaper, uh, but but I'll say better, faster, stronger is uh, is through through big data. Okay, we have our net ops tools are burping a lot of data to us on what's going on, how much capacity we really need, or how much capacity we've used. Um, software defined networks. I don't want to get into that because this is a DCO panel, but that is a that is going to be a big push to really be able to modify and change the network as required versus going through a, a standard arcane process of doing a network change as required. But on the DCO side. A whole other sets of sensors, about 1,300 sensors, really, uh, between the boundary midsection and enclave, burping, again, into the big data platform known as Acropolis uh, that we're using. And the big data analytics that are in place are really the ones that are going to tell us what we need to do next. Do we have the right uh, focus in the right areas? Where do we see um, issues or concerns that are going on? And this is the, the hard part is we can clearly defend against the known knowns what we're trying to get to is to get those indications and warnings to get ahead of some of that zero, zero day, zero minute, zero second defense side so we can become more predictive in our analysis using the network tools and the DCO tools that we have in place, be predictive so we can stop an attack before it happens, vice, respond to attack and do more forensics on why there was an attack, how bad was the attack, uh, what was the operational impact of the attack, is get left to the boom. We've talked about that a lot, and that's been a kind of a bumper sticker. Uh, but we're now getting into, I'll say nascent stages, but getting into having better predictive modeling based on what we're seeing on actions that we have using the machines today with analytics uh, on the big data platform that we have, again, known as Acropolis. Yeah, and we're very interested in that also because we have an initiative called Doe Norm. You know, we want to know what the normal operation is, of course, across the Doe also. So we're looking at XX spam emails, how many come in, you know, and Paul has a lot of that data already. But in order to paint a perfect picture for our boss and send it up the chain of command, I just can't go in and say, hey, sir, we had 15,000 spam, you know, or emails or X today without establishing that norm. Uh, and that's extremely hard. And based on this panel and some of the initiatives that's going on inside of DOD, hopefully we'll get there in the next year or so. Thank you. I gave you a timeline. <laughs> Captain Bus, you run a great panel. No questions from the audience. So one other topic. Go ahead. While, while he's coming up. So. so our customer clearly is the warfighter in this case. So one of the questions we talked about when we were building the panel is, what is the demand signal right now coming from the customer base? So uh, Paul and Sean, I think particularly you two, interface a lot with the warfighters, a lot with uh, the guys at sea, with the guys with guns. What, what are you seeing as far as the demand signal coming from them? Well, I always find the use of that word very interesting, uh, warfighter. Uh, I wasn't able to come to the conference yesterday, but I did watch the video that DISA put out uh, for this conference, and it closed out with uh, Enabler Warfighter, which I think is a, is a great way to describe what it is we do uh, and the fact that we all should take great pride in the fact that we are both warfighters and enablers. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, we, we look at the warfighter as a customer, and we look in the mirror at the same time. So the, group, the first question was about automation. Clearly, that's what we want more, automation. Um, those of us who work closer to the problem, that's the growing demand signal. They say, use the word nascent down where I work. We haven't s seen the benefit of automation yet. If there is a benefit, it's, in, it's transparent to us. In fact, um, every month down at, at our command, we run a, a design thinking workshop. I took the brief yesterday, and again, it was our most junior sailors wanting their process to be, to be more automated. They, they find as though that they, a lot of the work we are asking them to do is mindless, uh, and that's unfair as we try to build a very capable workforce, give them meaningful work to do, and then we don't challenge them with the real work that needs to be done. Uh, but I, from a, if you look out further to the warfighting spectrum, it's a demand for more. More awareness uh, and more of the expertise that, that we provide. So I mentioned that we have DCO deployers on every strike group in ARN. 
they want more of that. They're not necessarily going to embed, make everybody cyber warriors, if you will, but they want more cyber warriors afloat. I don't believe that's a responsible way forward. More people is not the answer. More automated process is, as well as more awareness and understanding for the shared problem at the local level. Um, so I, I'm a big proponent of you know, not creating more people, uh, but and not asking for more people, but leveraging partnerships and creating interdependencies across the larger team that has the shared mission. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, Captain Heritage, come back to your comment about training the cyber workforce. And you mentioned that the Navy got an, an initial good start and, and then that fell off. Uh, I've had uh, the opportunity to see what's going on down at Fort Gordon with the Army, uh, with the Cyber Center of Excellence there. Uh, do you think a effective way forward would be for all the services to jump on to, to that training platform that's evolving there uh, and kind of do a fee for service so, so you've got people coming out with a common base of training? Obviously, they're going to go back to their services. They're going to you know they're going to do things in accordance with what their service says. But but is that kind of standardized way of, of training the way to do it, or should it remain uh, separate service schoolhouses? So in a previous life, I was the J7 at Cybercom, um, and I totally believe that there should be joint solutions. Those who are familiar with JCAC, great example. Partnership. Much of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that is required across the force is shared. So we shouldn't have independent training solutions. There are areas where we need to have tailored solutions that build upon that initial investment. But we have sent down sailors to participate in that curriculum. We have given them feedback to, that, we, that would help them meet our requirements as well as theirs. But absolutely, joint should be our default, not surface centric. And, and we're in a unique situation since we own six cyber um, protection teams and they're all from different services. So two weeks ago I was down at Fort Gordon and I received a brief about all of the great initiatives they're doing for cyber. So we're working closely with our J7 to try to figure out a way that we can push some of our joint um, cyber protection team members down to Fort Gordon to do that same level of evaluation to see if we can start the ball rolling and then work closely with Cybercom to see if we can make that the standard across the board. Uh, so that's definitely an initiative that we're trying to undertake. So uh, we know that DOD has this concerted effort to deploy mobile devices um, all the way down to the lowest sailor soldier. Um, and we know a lot of these mobile devices have uh, personal apps, personal email, and so forth, and they're connected in some way to, the, to our DOD networks. So can you comment on additional risks, additional issues you're seeing from, from a cyber operational perspective uh, based on the mobile devices being deployed? Yeah, it's not me. So, as you, I'll say, I, I believe that happens, but I have no personal apps on my government cell phone because if configured properly, you have no personal apps on your government cell phone because they're not approved by Puma. Well, so well, that's just for DISA. Yeah. Well, right. So yeah. I would highly encourage best business practices yes. yeah. to not put personal applications on government devices because it does induce risk into into the environment. And I think as we get better and we use more, I know we tried BYOD for a while. I know this isn't the panel for BYOD, but I know we tried BYOD for a while and we tried some different software we could open up a personal instance within a government uh, within a government cell phone. Um, we tried that for a while and it kind of kind of died off a little bit. Um, I think we're going to have to get to something like that again if we're going to have to expand the number of people that want to use mobility devices or lock down the governmental mobility yeah. devices to ensure that we don't add on additional risk by putting applications on there that track things that people may or not be fully uh, aware of. So as a former WACA commander, you know, putting cell phones in the hands of 22-year-old staffers, yeah, it's some pretty sleepless nights. But at the same time, we put some measures in place that would clearly lock down the cell phone. Uh, exactly what Paul was talking about, best business practice associated with it. Um, and there is a lot of technology out there that will help uh, lock down your mobile devices, um, even at the, the presidential level, to where you can feel confident that your cell phone is securing your portion of the network. 
So and I, I can comment on a couple of those. So, so I think we clearly see the trend towards mobility, right? If you ask the director uh, what's his number one priority right now, he would say mobility. Uh, um, and he's talked a lot about it in the forums uh, and trying to build all of our different applications across DoD to fit the mobile platform. Uh, you've got chipsets now that run Windows 10. Uh, so we see a clear trend, right, so towards mobile computing. Uh, and you look at the folks like uh, uh, the mobile the JSOC communities and those folks that are, that are clearly trending towards getting away from any desktop and towards a mobile platform. So that is clearly where we're going uh, from an innovation standpoint. And, and I know Brian's team has spent a lot of time and a lot of effort uh, working through those problem sets. Thank you. My name is Bill Scott. I'm with STG. Uh, we've talked a lot in terms of a strategy discussion about technology and capabilities. I'm wondering about more of the interpersonal relationships between the various operation centers of the Doden and each of the services. Has there been any um, evolution or do you foresee any evolution or changes in how we organizationally operate uh, in terms of our facilities or our battle rhythms? in order to produce a, a collaboration that's sort of enhanced to meet these challenges. So, yes, sir, there's, that is the biggest challenge, in my opinion, from the day I walked in as a J3 until now. Uh, and the structure that I mentioned earlier about designing the battle captain, the JDOC, our Joint Operations Center, in term of battle station, is going to help push that in the right direction, in my opinion. Uh, so basically, we're taking more of an operational approach. I've said that 30 times, but operational approach is what we're instilling every day, not only in the defensive cyber forces, but inside the workforce at JFHU Doden. So the structure of agencies, service cyber components, combatant commands, liaisons, law enforcement, three other three-letter organizations, cybercom, pulling that information back up to JFHU Doden and establishing that same format with inside of JFHQ Doden is going to help push that out to the service cyber components and the other agencies. So hopefully we're creating the model that we like for other operation centers to use to communicate back to us. Also I mentioned Operation on Gladiator Shield, which is our order. That order is specifically going to tell each one of these components and agencies what reports are required to communicate back to us. Now that establishes a clear line of communications and almost like a template format. So if you're talking to someone at the agency desk, you're not talking about 17 different forms. You're talking about one specific nine-line simple reporting mechanism that we can use to answer the questions not only for our three-star but also for Admiral Rogers. So the model that we're creating in-house, sir, we want to push down to other organizations so they could structure or provide that information back to us in a similar format. And that's how we plan on building that relationship. Thank you. You know, the answer to that, the answer to that question uh, reminded me of an article I read this morning that talked about the CNO has, has deemed that we have, I won't say we've left, but the age of precision has existed for a while. Now we're in the age of decision. So it's the speed of decision. But when we talk about who we are informing, we're talking about informing three and four star level leaders um, as opposed to really empowering and informing O3 and E7 level oh, leaders. And, and that's where I think that the, the amount of information we have at our disposal is driving the requirement to make decisions to a higher level. Right. But it's really about the speed of decision, which needs to be delegated. So so we haven't spent enough time of, about um, of thinking through our processes and deciding at what level these important decisions should be made, you know, and who is authorized to make them. And I think in order to do that, you have to train people at that level. I know we grew up, and we can probably talk about it, even at the second lieutenant level, you're making decisions. I mean, and you didn't have to go all the way up the chain of command to make that decision. You were held accountable and responsible for your actions at that lower level. I think we need to instill that back into our O3s and O4s and say, if you make a decision on the watch floor and it's midnight, as long as you tell me you made that decision, I'm okay. But now we've moved into an environment to where sometimes we've hammered them so much that they don't make those key decisions in the middle of the night that they wait and hold information until some senior leader arrives. So I 100% agree with you, um, but just 25 years in the military, I've seen that, that decision making continue to move up the chain of command, and I'm, and I'm kind of getting into an article I want to write, um, but move up the chain of command to the point to where my O3, when I come in at 07 in the morning and saying, hey sir, here's information. 
Where's the analysis? What decision did you make? Sir, I'm giving you raw data. And whereas in 06, I would prefer the polished information with a level of analysis and maybe some COAs associated with it. Right? It may not be the point to your, of your question, um, but the battle rhythm. The battle rhythm is oriented towards informing vertically, that is not horizontally. And that's where I think we could get a lot better, a lot yeah. better. And I think that's your point as well. From and one part of OGS, and I'll leave this alone. One part of OGS is we're pushing information back down. I can't continue to beat up the service cyber component combatant commands without giving them information. And that's the part of this cycle that we're trying to create. Thank you, gentlemen. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to have to apologize. I'm afraid we're out of time. But if you want to come up, we'll answer your question. Now, we're going to be here for about 10 more minutes uh, answering questions. But I want to thank everyone for coming today.